It just could not get any worse. It was hell, pure unmitigated hell from every angle. For over a hundred years, far, far beneath the surface of the earth, this eldritch specter lies, keeping an ominous vigil over the darkest depths of the Atlantic Ocean, filled with the remains of hundreds upon hundreds of human beings who sank with this monstrosity of a ship one doom-filled day in spring of 1912. Again, it has been over 110 years since this catastrophe took place and yet no bodies have ever been discovered within the wreckage. Why is that? Also, do you realize how sad that is? These were people who had full lives and aspirations and careers and families waiting for them back home who are now trapped at the bottom of the ocean forever. Even the governments of two of the most powerful nations on earth the US and the UK couldn't get them out. As a result, over 1,100 victims' bodies have never been found. At approximately 11.40 p.m. on April 14, 1912, the largest ocean liner in the world at the time, the RMS Titanic, struck an iceberg off the coast of Newfoundland on its maiden voyage after departing from Southampton, England. She never made it to New York City, where she was originally bound. This was one of the first and most devastating mass casualty events that would plague the 20th century, but it was by no means the last. The 20th century would go on to become the deadliest century in human history by far, full of sheer chaos, financial ruin, violence, unspeakable horrors, and global destruction. The tragedy of the Titanic would echo for decades to come, but also served as a harrowing portent of the pandemonium to come. Believe it or not, the actual wreckage of the Titanic wouldn't be discovered until decades later, in September 1985 to be exact, by a submersible from oceanographer Robert Ballard's expedition. It ended where it began, 400 miles off the coast of Newfoundland. The great ship went down after striking an iceberg. Never a trace was found. That mystery was explained today. The Titanic is two and a half miles beneath the surface. Scientists in a miniature submarine made the discovery early this morning. Ballard was on a secret U.S. Navy mission to investigate two wrecked nuclear submarines from the Cold War, which would be the USS Treasure and the USS Scorpion. After this mission was completed, he was permitted to search for the Titanic, and thankfully he found it, which was a huge history-altering discovery, including eventually influencing a company founded in 2009 called Oceangate, which would 
soon become infamous for its highly hazardous crude submersible expeditions, mainly ferrying the ultra-rich on deep-sea voyages into the Atlantic to witness the Titanic wreckage firsthand, which purely in the spirit of human exploration is insanely cool in my opinion. However, cut to 2023 and the true risk of these expeditions suddenly came to light. After the implosion of the fated Ocean Gate submersible in June 2023, which essentially vaporized five of its passengers on board, the world once more became captivated by the RMS Titanic and her many timeless mysteries. There were also lots of despicable, cruel memes that I'll admit were difficult not to laugh at, even if you were a part of the minority who were actually heartbroken about the five deaths on board the Smersible, including a 19-year-old kid who reportedly only joined the voyage to make his father happy for Father's Day. And if you can't relate to or empathize with that on some level, are you even human? There is something about viewing the Titanic as a malevolent entity haunting the deep sea trenches that is both petrifying and highly accurate. Sensationalized by one of the most enchanting romantic films in recent decades, this tragic real-life tale has become rather difficult to distinguish from the cinematic universe created by James Cameron. If you're anything like me and grew up in the 90s, then you've probably never really stopped to ponder just how horrifying the real story of the Titanic actually was. When I think of the Titanic, many words come to mind, mainly grandeur, mystery, overindulgence, and stupidity. In an amazing feat, the Titanic and everything concerning it and everything surrounding the tragedy somehow represents the best and worst of humanity simultaneously. Things like human ingenuity, the sublime, the grandiose, the intrepid, but also hubris, class disparity, sexism, criminal negligence, utter despair, mass casualties, and mass deceit. The next thing that comes to mind when I think of the Titanic is its enduring mystery and intrigue and its final resting place, which is as otherworldly as it is enchanting. It sits at over 1400 feet beneath sea level or over two miles deep. The Titanic was a magnificent feat of engineering, innovation, and opulence. It was the second gargantuan ocean liner built in an Olympic class series by British shipping line White Star Line. These three ships were referred to as sister ships, the RMS Olympic, the RMS Titanic, and the HMHS Britannic. The RMS Titanic stood for Royal Mail Steamer, meaning the ship contained a fully functional post office and was authorized to carry mail across the Atlantic Ocean. Construction of the Titanic commenced in March 1909 when the keel was first laid in a shipyard in Belfast, Ireland by the shipbuilding company Harlan & Wolfe. At the time, the company was owned by Lord William James Perry, who was a friend of Bruce Ishmay, the chairman of White Star Line, and the uncle of Thomas Andrews, who was the chief designer of the Titanic. And since there was no digital technology or 3D architectural mock-ups available to aid the naval designers in envisioning a craft of this magnitude, these visionaries all worked by hand when dreaming up every intricate detail of this behemoth, and that was a testament to their vision and skill. There are some excellent videos out there with great animation that I'll link in the description that I recommend watching, both about the Titanic's interior and engineering, as well as what physically happened to the vessel and its passengers in the final five horrifying minutes of the ship sinking. But let's take a quick look at the numbers. Amazingly, the Titanic was 882 feet long, which was the equivalent of four city blocks, and weighed about 46,000 tons. It was also 175 feet in height, owing to a total of 10 decks. 3,000 Irish shipbuilders worked tirelessly on hull number 401 for over two years to create the Colossus, soon to be christened the Titanic by May of 1911. Disturbingly, the ship was always destined to snatch souls, it seems, as it was evidenced by eight workers dying during its very construction. Many died from falling from terrible heights or from being crushed by its massive parts, including a 15-year-old boy. Once the ship was completed, the ultimate cost reigned in at about $7.5 million dollars which today, with inflation taken into consideration, would be around $200 million. By the way, this was the same amount of the freaking budget for the 1997 film. Then, after passing her sea trials in Belfast, the Titanic departed for Southampton, 
and would arrive on April 3rd, 1912. At around noon on April 10th, 1912, the vessel would depart from the White Star Dock in Southampton, destined for New York City, first stopping by Cherbourg in France and Queenstown in Ireland to pick up passengers, crew, and supplies. Speaking of the crew, let's take a look at the one assigned to the ship for her maiden voyage. Two of the most notable figures were the Scottish first officer, William Murdoch, who we'll discuss more later, and Edward John Smith, a British sea captain and naval officer who captained the Titanic. Both were employed by White Star Line. Captain Smith was the highest paid captain in the world in 1912 and typically captained all of the White Star Line's newest vessels due to his prominence and skill. He also captained the first of the three Olympic class White Star Line sister ships called the Olympic and also saw her through the ordeal of being struck by a warship but surviving. Born in January 1850, he was six 62 years old at the time of his final voyage. Though built to accommodate the passenger capacity of about 3,300 people, at the time of her maiden voyage, the vessel thankfully only had about 2,200 passengers on board, which was still a tremendous loss. 324 passengers were in first class, 284 in second class, and 709 in third class, all totaling about 1,317 passengers. Over 900 crew members were also on board, including wait staff, engineering, and deck crews. Obviously, Jack and Rose were entirely fictional characters, but there were a few interesting key characters from the movie that are actually from reality. So here are some of the most noteworthy passengers that were on board the ship that day, many of them having died on board. A banker and heir to a mining magnate, Benjamin Guggenheim. What a great surname, by the way. And oh boy, did he live up to it. And that's Benjamin Guggenheim and his mistress, Madame Aubert. Mrs. Guggenheim is at home with the children, of course. On the night of the sinking, he died dressed to the nines, looking dapper as hell, determined to go down as a gentleman. These are for you, Mr. Guggenheim. Oh, thank you. We are dressed in our best and are prepared to go down as gentlemen. That clip was based on true eyewitness accounts of his final moments, by the way. And following his honorable death, he would later be dragged into a baseless conspiracy theory about why the Titanic sank that included the banker J.P. Morgan, which we'll discuss later. There was also Major Archibald Willingham Butt, who was President Taft's military aide, Bruce Ishmay, who was the managing director of White Star Line. And our master shipbuilder, Mr. Andrews here, designed her from the keel plates up. Uh. I may have knocked her together, but my dear, it's Mr. Ismet. Isidore Strauss, a wealthy New York merchant and Macy's owner, whose wife, Ida, deboarded a lifeboat to courageously face death with him, even when she didn't have to. All right, Mrs. Strauss. No, please. Mrs. Strauss, this is the last lifeboat. Please, sir. I'm a very old lady. I've been with Mr. Strauss most of my life. I will not leave him now. That is wildly courageous and a universal demonstration of true love. And of course, there was also the notorious Denver millionaire and philanthropist, Margaret the Unsinkable Molly Brown. She became famous for demanding that her lifeboat return and help other passengers, which it never did, as well as helping to row her boat to safety for hours, and later helping to raise funds to bury or support other passengers who had lost everything on board. Also on board, who we saw depicted in the movie by the handsome Victor Garber, was of course the ship's lead designer, Thomas Andrews. Also worth noting, the richest passenger on board the Titanic was financier John Jacob Astor, who was worth about $87 million at the time of the disaster, which is worth about $2.2 billion with inflation today. He actually built New York's famous Astoria Hotel, which would later become known as the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, as well as New York's Hotel St. Regis, among other notable businesses. Sadly, he drowned in the disaster, but fortunately his pregnant wife survived. J.P. Morgan, one of the owners of White Star Line, was supposed to be on board the Titanic as well, but canceled his passage at the last minute for undetermined reasons.
like I say, or I'll shoot you all like dogs. Keep order here. Keep order, I say. The accommodations were magnificent through and through. According to the New York Times via History.com, the luxury liner was carrying cargo worth $420,000, which would be around $11 million today with inflation. The manifest included items such as 3,000 teacups, because you can never really have enough tea, five grand pianos, 40,000 eggs, which sounds like heaven to me, and 36,000 oranges. Wow, those blind, albino, deep sea creatures must have had a filled day with those oranges. There were 840 guest bedrooms, 416 in first class, 162 in second class, class and 262 in third class. Notice the numbers here based on the passenger demographics. The first class had the second least passengers on board but the most rooms by far because they all had private accommodations. The third class represented the largest portion of the passengers yet had the fewest rooms because multiple people shared each room and according to Good Housekeeping the most opulent suites on the ship, such as the suite Rose shared with her fiancé and mother in the film. There were only four of these suites on board, and the tickets cost a whopping $4,350, which is an unbelievable $115,060 today with inflation. That's the cost of a freaking house, maybe in the 90s, but it's still unbelievable. On board the ship, apart from the luxurious staterooms of the first class and the accommodations of the lower classes, was a gymnasium filled with state-of-the-art exercise equipment, such as a bike, a rowing machine, an electric horse, a swimming pool, Turkish baths, a squash court, which is something similar to racquetball, a post office, a Parisian cafe, a restaurant, restaurant that offered fine dining, and a smoking room which sold fine cigars and tobacco products. It's said that for a final meal on board the ship, first class passengers enjoyed a 10 course meal full of gourmet dishes such as oysters, consomme, poached salmon, filet mignon, and lamb with mint sauce. Second class passengers had traditional French bistro and American dishes, while third class passengers, also referred to as steerage due to the location of some of their quarters, were provided with soup and stew. Wow, that is just really predictable, isn't it? Over 30,000 oranges and they couldn't even have one. However, it was said that second class accommodations and cabins on the Titanic were actually equivalent to first class accommodations on other ships at the time and that the third class accommodations on the Titanic were equivalent to second class accommodations on board other ships. So I guess at least the accommodations were a step up from the standards of the time. Although I'm not sure what good any of it really did since everybody fucking died anyway. But the second class accommodations such as those shown here ran about $60 which with inflation would have been around $1,700 today. Third class accommodations would have cost around $35 at the time and that's essentially equivalent to $1,000 today. And suddenly the realization that I couldn't even afford a third class ticket right now just feels really dire. The bathroom situation was also quite dreadful for third class passengers. Over 700 of them had to share the same accommodations, meaning hundreds shared two tubs and far fewer water closets or toilets than the first and second class passengers, despite being the majority on board, which is just ghastly. Whereas many of the first class passengers had at private bathrooms or en suites if you will in their suites but i guess they better have for freaking hundred thousand dollar tickets and just to illustrate more of the accommodation discrimination there were about 25 different staircases on board separated by class and according to good housekeeping first class passengers were treated to three gilded electric elevators because of course they had to be gilded located right in front of the grand staircase. There was also another slightly less lavish elevator available to second class passengers. And I suppose the third class passengers just had to take the stairs. Also, if you're wondering how there is so much great photography that survived the trip and captured many passengers candidly on board, it's because photographer Francis Brown must have had some sort of presentiment of doom ahead of the disaster as he boarded the ship in Southampton, England on April 10th, intending to stay for the full trip 
trip, but exited when the ship stopped in Queenstown and didn't continue the voyage to New York. Thus, 80 or so of his photographs survived the catastrophe and have thankfully immortalized what life was like on the Titanic before it met its ultimate fate. The unsinkable reputation of the Titanic that you may have heard of could in part be attributed to a new innovative design included in its construction, that being the revolutionary watertight bulkheads or walls that separate different ship compartments that could be sealed off in case of a hull breach, meaning in case of flooding. This innovation is what led some to wrongly believe the ship was quote unquote practically unsinkable or that quote unquote God himself couldn't sink this ship to which God responded challenge accepted the first three days of the voyage passed without incident but on the 14th of April 1912 the Titanic's radio operators received about six messages from other ships warning them of drifting ice these messages were received by a telegram which was basically Morse code signals transmitted over telegraph technology or a wire and sent and received in the wireless operator room. However, these many helpful warnings would do positively nothing to alter the course of the ship, its speed, or its ultimate fate. Interestingly, the top speed of the Titanic was 24 knots, which is around 21 miles per hour. In terms of a car, that's not fast at all. It's actually incredibly slow. Granted, I know absolutely zero about captaining a ship, but I'm positive there are key elements that distinguish ship speed from car speed. Critical factors that make this 21 miles per hour far more challenging to navigate a vessel of that magnitude in water versus a car with tires on pavement. Also, what's not often talked about is that due to weather conditions and it being night at the time, the iceberg in question wasn't seen clearly, even from a short distance, due to an optical illusion caused by the haze on the horizon. So, the men in the crow's nest, whose very job it was to look out for icebergs, didn't see the iceberg until the very last minute. Also, also, contributing to the collision with the iceberg is that it takes a lot of maneuvering to shift a ship's course that suddenly. And First Officer Murdoch is reported to have given specific instructions during this emergency maneuvering to avoid hitting the ship's propellers. Sadly, despite what I'm sure were their best efforts after the iceberg was spotted, the ship indeed collided with the iceberg along its starboard side or right side and the damage it left was overwhelming. At approximately 11.40 p.m. on April 14th, 1912, the iceberg cut a hole in the hull of the ship beneath the water line over 200 feet long. and essentially rendered its unsinkable bulkhead technology futile. In addition to damage caused by a fire in one of the ship's coal bunkers that had burned for some 10 days before they set sail, warping one of the walls that was integral to the bulkhead compartments, stopping the ship from flooding. But flood it did, and soon the ship began listing or canting or slanting as its depths were open to the Atlantic Ocean. Eerily, it's reported that the Titanic spotted the lights of another ship nearby at the time, roughly five miles away. Due to this fact, a little after midnight, they shot distress rockets into the sky and even signaled a distress message in Morse cold with one of the ship's lamps. Captain Edward Smith, who historians believe to have been in a state of shock at this point due to his many reported blunders during this critical time for rescue, even ordered some of the crew to take out a lifeboat and roll some of the passengers over towards the mysterious ship in the distance to drop them off and return for more. That's how close the other ship was. However, it was all to no avail as the nearby ship either didn't see them or perhaps didn't care. Perhaps they weren't interested in risking their own lives to attempt to rescue the massive ocean liner trapped amid a perilous field of ice, very much unlike the intrepid men at the helm of the Carpathia, who would come to the rescue and save the 700 Titanic passengers despite being over four hours away from the Titanic at the time of its sinking. They still came to the rescue. Shockingly, by the time they arrived, it would have only been to hundreds of stiff and dead bodies afloat in the inky water amongst their possessions and great chunks of debris, as well as over 20 or so lifeboats that had managed to escape. The largest and most luxurious ship in the world would have already vanished deep into the Atlantic by the time they arrived, as though it were simply swallowed up by the earth. But who was this 
other mysterious ship cruising only a mere five miles away from the scene of the wreckage and could have helped to spare every single life on board the Titanic had those gutless cowards bothered to respond to its distress calls or the rockets sent up desperately every few minutes into the night sky. Well, it was reported to have been the SS Californian, a British steamship. Let's talk about the lifeboat predicament. The Titanic was reportedly equipped to carry 65 lifeboats, but only contained a measly 20, and four of those being collapsible, not nearly enough to accommodate the passengers and crew on board, not even by half. However, defenders argued that the lifeboat protocol on board ships at the time was determined by the weight and tonnage based on the 1883 Merchant Shipping Act and not the number of passengers on board and therefore the Titanic had more than enough lifeboats according to the standards of the time. How incredibly idiotic is that? It really took for something this disastrous to happen and this many lives to have been lost before governing bodies realized the error of their ways. What a completely novel idea that there should be enough lifeboats on board to actually accommodate the number of human beings. Holy crap. But not all that occurred that night was demonstrative of human failure or cowardice. There were many acts of chivalry, such as the many men who accepted their fate graciously and allowed women and children to be prioritized for the life-saving efforts, and some women even choosing to stay behind with those they loved, like Ida Strauss, who was the wife of the owner of Macy's. This notion was encapsulated perfectly in the movie by Jack sacrificing himself for Rose multiple times, Rose sacrificing herself for Jack, and her even jumping back on board the ship from the safety of the lifeboat she had secured passage in to face certain death with him. Also, during the sinking, it's reported that the eight musicians on board continued to play, likely as a diversion to the despair and horror, and as a morale booster for the crew who worked tirelessly to save as many lives as possible. All eight musicians chose to go down with the ship in an act of such bravery and self-sacrifice it brings a pain to your heart. Other unsung heroes on board the ship were the engineering crew. They gallantly remained at their post in the boiler room despite the flooding underbelly of the ship and what must have been horrid conditions and great trepidation, working the pumps in order to control the flooding as much as they possibly could. This was also to ensure the power on the ship stayed on during the mass evacuation and thereby enabled the wireless radio system to continue sending distress calls to nearby ships. The tireless efforts of this altruistic crew ensured the survival of 700 or so individuals fortunate enough to make it out of harm's way although the cost of their valor in the face of such unprecedented danger was their own lives. Tragically, the engineering crew were among the many who did not survive the disaster. The captain also went down with the ship. That's about all that's known of him for certain. His final moments are in truth still somewhat of a mystery. There were reports that he was swept off the ship by a wave, others that he died being heroic and stoic to the end, others that he unalived himself with a pistol, some said he jumped from the ship and dove into the water alone, Others say he jumped off the ship with an infant in his arms for whatever reason I could not fathom. There were also some accounts from semi-credible sources that claimed to have spotted Captain Smith alive after the disaster and residing in America. Obviously, all of these fables can't possibly be true, but it does beg the question, what on earth happened to the captain of the ship? It's shocking that it isn't explicitly known. If I had to wager a guess, it would be that he entered the belly of the ship as the lights flickered out in shock and mortification for what he had done and laid down and waited to die. I cannot see him dying any other way, especially not a man as stoic as he. I cannot see him jumping into the water and flailing and screaming with the hundreds of others in some undignified panic. That's not how a tried and true, disciplined naval officer and the captain of a ship would go out. I simply see him coming to a place where he capitulated to the reality of the situation and recognizing that his actions, which amounted to criminal negligence with how he operated the ship and ignored the many warnings he received beforehand about the perils of ice ahead contributed largely if not solely to the death and chaos and utter despair among him and it's also reported that he may have been egged on at the time by mr bruce ismay a spineless white star line chairman who was apparently obsessed with showing off the ship's speed and allegedly pressured captain smith to keep up a reckless pace i think a lot of the blame was on bruce ismay May, the chairman. He was he the chairman of the shipping line. He was the chairman of the shipping line. I'm very much afraid he influenced Captain Smith so much that we 
We went straight for the ice. There was no question about it. We were absolutely thrown away. Why? For the sake of speed. We shouldn't have been anywhere near there because we had warnings that there was ice and there was ice all over the place. We had it from ships and shore. And we went straight ahead as if there was nothing there in our way. And who was also cowardly and slinked into a lifeboat and survived the event despite likely contributing to the ship's ultimate downfall. And still, regardless of whatever peer pressure he may have potentially been under, Edward Smith was a veteran sea captain and a naval officer, and the decision still ultimately came down to him. And he factually received warnings of ice and had plenty of time to slow down following those warnings, but chose not to for whatever reason. So I don't think he could face his thoughtless decisions and the pandemonium he caused anymore. And I believe he went into the ship to die alone in private and probably in shock, which is why no one else knows precisely what happened to him or even where he was in the ship's final moments. Sadly, the ship sank less than three hours after hitting the iceberg. That seems fairly rapid, right? Just like in 9-11, there was simply no escape. You had to just decide how you wanted to die at that point, either freezing to death or drowning to death. So turns out that the freezing water the passengers were left to wallow in was about 28 degrees. Therefore, the majority died due to hypothermia. The unsettling part is 79 degrees can lead to death after prolonged exposure. I'm assuming this is Fahrenheit. 50 degrees can cause death within an hour and 32 degrees can be lethal within 15 minutes. Deeply, deeply troubling stuff. So what happens to the body in water that cold, you ask? Basically, blood flow slows to the extremities first then the vital organs and soon they all shut down and you would essentially just drift away into oblivion never to return to the waking world again so the vast majority of the people in the water did not drown they simply froze to death due to hypothermia and in a very short amount of time the idea of rose surviving by balancing on top of a piece of wood is actually inspired by a Chinese passenger who managed to survive by doing the same and was eventually picked up by a lifeboat. As long as he was out of the water, he was able to maintain a body temperature that did not lead to hypothermia. Some of the other issues plaguing the poor people who had jumped from the boat, aside from the below freezing water they were left to wallow in for hours, the pitch blackness around them since it was the dead of night in the middle of the North Atlantic, the lifeboats leaving them behind even with plenty of room to spare, and no hope of any rescue ship reaching them before hypothermia set in was also the fact that this monstrosity of a ship they had abandoned in hopes of saving themselves from drowning began to break apart. The ship breaking apart probably wasn't anticipated by anyone and it did so at an alarming rate. As pictured in the movie, the gigantic funnels of the ship began to break loose and crash into the water directly on top of those who had recently fled the ship, as if they didn't have enough to worry about already. It just could not get any worse. It was hell, pure unmitigated hell from every angle. What followed in the aftermath of this horrific disaster was a media frenzy, in part due to the number of notable figures on board the ship, as well as journalists being desperate to have the first scoop and paint the event in a particular light based on their individual biases. According According to paperless archives, this led to countless sensationalized reports, stories, special sections, photographs, and editorials being created, and many wildly inaccurate accounts of the disaster spread far and wide. As photography and telegraph technology were underway at the time, the Titanic was one of the first news stories to receive real-time, unrelenting, worldwide coverage that spread very far, very rapidly. A wildfire is an understatement. Therefore, there was a ton of confusion and inaccuracies in the media reporting as the breaking news came in and was filtered through different publications. Not until April 17th did the reports concerning the disaster become more detailed and more accurate with less of a bias towards reporting optimistic headlines. Look at this wildly inaccurate headline from April 16th, 1912. The London Daily Mail, Titanic sunk, no lives lost, collision with an iceberg, largest ship in the world, 2,358 lives in peril, rush of liners to the rescue, 
all passengers taken off. My God, could they have been more wrong? Seems to me they got an early tip about the collision and as opposed to waiting for more verified information, completely fabricated the remainder of the headline in pursuit of being the first to report the breaking news and make it as optimistic as possible despite it being an abject lie. This is a quote from the paperless archives that I thought to be quite astute. The horror and loss that constituted the disaster of the sinking of the Titanic evoked a strong human need to find something heroic, even redemptive in the event. Later research by scholars have not been able to substantiate many inflated tales of honor and daring do that were widely reported to a stunned public. Most Titanic researchers find no hard evidence to support the widely reported story that Titanic victim Major Butt single-handedly stood between men who to save themselves would deny the extraction of women and children from the sinking Titanic. Turns out the American press had an advantage over the British press following the accident when it came to reporting firsthand details of the aftermath as the survivors were still delivered to New York as intended. And sadly, there were several eyewitness reports stating that first officer William Murdoch unalived himself by shooting himself through the temple. 325 first class passengers were on board the Titanic and 202 of them survived, which is is a decent ratio of surviving passengers. Around 285 second class passengers were on board and 118 of them survived. Around 709 third class passengers were on board but only a mere 174 third class passengers survived. Over 900 crew members were on board including wait staff, engineering, and deck crews but 679 members of the crew died in the sinking. In the days following the sinking of the Titanic, bodies were recovered from the open ocean and about 328 fatality reports were created for deceased individuals detailing their physical appearance and characteristics and the possessions on their person. This was done in an effort to identify the deceased and to notify their next of kin. According to the Nova Scotia archive, with handwritten annotations scrawled by various hands, the check marks and deletions the occasional label or business card pinned to the pages are all silent reminders of the confusion and immense distress that marked the loss of the Titanic and its human cargo. Out of the 328 fatality reports, only 209 bodies would be embalmed and physically delivered to the city of Halifax in Nova Scotia, Canada, as the other 119 individuals were buried at sea because they were too disfigured to be identified. I'm not sure what may have made them too disfigured to be identified, probably the expressions on their faces when they froze to death or like frostbite or something disfiguring their faces. Either way, it's just another Titanic mystery and it's something that's so eerie to think about. They were wrapped in canvas and weighed down with iron bars and sent to join their counterparts at the bottom of the ocean. Here is a list of the individual names either recovered or buried at sea. And even with identifiable features, there were still around 150 bodies buried in the city of Halifax, unable to be identified. And the number of those buried at sea who are yet unidentified on this list is even more heartbreaking. But what's worse is that there's still well over 1,000 individuals who went down with the ship whose bodies bodies were never recovered because their bodies were dragged to the bottom of the ocean. Of the bodies lost to the world inside of the Titanic wreckage, funeral director and mortician Caitlin Dowdy says, the oxygen carried in deep sea currents would have decomposed the flesh of those on board and deep sea scavenger animals like worms and fish would have eaten the flesh from the bodies. It was also thought that due to the seawater chemistry at those depths, the water would have basically dissolved human bodies completely, including bones and teeth. This would explain why human remains have never been found on board, despite many personal effects and even remnants of stained glass still remaining. For there has also been speculation that if bodies were trapped deep within the ship, such as in the engine room where the deep sea organisms couldn't reach, there may possibly still be some human remains. But I suppose the world may never know.
Following the Titanic tragedy, inquiries or investigations were held by the U.S. and British governments to determine how the ship sank and why. Strangely, the British inquiry ended up exonerating Captain Smith of his criminal negligence, claiming he did what any other captain would have done under the circumstances. Right. It's not like they were totally biased or anything and trying to save face in the wake of one of the deadliest peacetime, maritime catastrophes known to man, which sat soundly on the shoulders of the British and their full hearty countrymen who were the chief architects behind this disastrous event. They weren't trying to trivialize the captain's role in causing the ship to crash, or the fact that there weren't enough lifeboats on board by half, or the fact that the lifeboats they did have weren't being filled to capacity. Sure, that's all totally normal and fine behavior, and Captain Smith and White Star Line did positively nothing wrong. Rightfully, the American inquiry was slightly more critical in its judgment of Smith and the negligence as a whole, with quotes emerging from Senator William Alden Smith, such as, Captain Smith's indifference to danger was one of the direct and contributing causes of this unnecessary tragedy. However, he gave him credit for his manly bearing, whatever the hell that means, and his tender solicitude for the safety of women and little children, as well as his willingness to die, which seems fair to me. Had he survived while hundreds of others perished due to his carelessness, now that would have been a whole different level of craven. It's worth noting that the highest percentage of victims were from steerage, or third class, and they were largely immigrants coming to America. There would later be an issue raised of why the first class passengers were allowed into the lifeboats ahead of those in second and third class. I think we all know why, but that doesn't make it ethical or okay. Limited liability laws at the time greatly restricted the passengers' ability to recover losses from White Star Line or to sue for damages. However, the survivors and families of the deceased sought millions in redress, hundreds of claims totaling well over 16 million. According to archives.gov, the outcome of the hearings or the inquiries was a variety of corrective legislation for the maritime industry, including new regulations regarding numbers of lifeboats and life jackets required for passenger vessels. In 1914, as a result of the Titanic disaster, the International Ice Patrol was formed. Thirteen nations supported a branch of the U.S. Coast Guard that scouted for the presence of icebergs in the Atlantic and Arctic Oceans. The Titanic's legacy endures on. It includes countless documentaries, multiple films, loads of art, numerous museums and exhibitions, and some very strange and ridiculous theories that have found popularity on social media today. There are many, many bizarre conspiracy theories circulating about the Titanic and its sinking and its passengers, from the ship never really sinking and the event being staged as part of a massive insurance scheme, all the way to a cursed mummy having caused a catastrophic sinking, as well as other destruction across London at the time. But one of the most bizarre and totally unsubstantiated theories about the Titanic sinking was that it was done deliberately and that it was a scheme cooked up by the villainous American banker and owner of White Star Line, J.P. Morgan. I took particular interest in this theory because I used to work for Chase Bank and had to learn about the history of J.P. Morgan in training, so I just thought I would look into it. So essentially, the theory goes that J.P. Morgan was scheduled to be on board the Titanic, which is factually true, but canceled within three hours of boarding, which is not totally true. He did cancel before boarding, but it was much more in advance than three hours. The theory then goes on to suggest that this was indeed a setup to get three key figures on board who opposed the forming of a centralized banking system, that being the Federal Reserve. Those figures were John Astor, the richest man on the ship, who died, Isidore Strauss, the owner of Macy's, who died, and Benjamin Guggenheim, the one who dressed like a gentleman and went down with the ship. Because these three men were on board, the Titanic was set up to sail full speed ahead into a known field of ice to kill hundreds, including the captain and many of his crew. So then that would imply that this was really a side mission for these men, just to silence three men who opposed the Federal Reserve being formed? That's idiotic, least of all because two of them made no comment on the Federal Reserve in either direction and one of them actually supported it. There is simply no evidence to support this theory at all and it has been thoroughly debunked. This conspiracy theory is widely contested by several experts and Titanic historians and it's plain to see why. It was also noted by credible sources that J.P. Morgan had fallen ill and wanted to take treatment treatment while in France with his mistress and also wanted to oversee the transfer of his art treasures home to America before a law in France was enacted that banned Americans from making such transactions. 
The abject failure of the Titanic and its crew, I cannot begin to wrap my head around. To fail this miserably took calculation and an absurd amount of criminal negligence and complacency from multiple parties. As I conclude this video, I can only think of the poor forgotten passengers who boarded a ship one day on April 10th, 1912, having no clue the peril that would befall them. And for the life of me, I can't imagine what that level of fear and distress must have been like, resigning to your fate as this gargantuan, groaning ship went pitch black around you, and all you hear is the roar of rushing water filling the bowels of the vessel, breaking apart its infrastructure with thunderous force, the halls and rooms becoming blistering cold as this foaming white onslaught rushed the ship, leaving not a single nook or cranny untouched, and like a deep sea phantom, it finally arrives at the room you've barricaded yourself in to no avail. But you cannot even see its arrival because the lights went out long ago. So you feel its freezing currents overtake you as you panic and pray completely in vain for a savior who will not come. And soon your lungs are overtaken with stabbing cold water and your flame is finally snuffed. Thank you ever so much for joining me on this journey. I had so much fun researching the Titanic. It's been a fascination of mine since I was a kid and first watched the movie with my aunt. We had it on VHS and watched it on an old VCR and it was just such an enchanting movie to me. So um, I appreciate you watching. If you made it this far, I cannot wait to bring more videos your way. The next video will be a deep dive on Amanda Bynes. So I will see you in about two weeks. Take care. Bye-bye.